still rocking after all these years. This is the story of my rock and roll butler. This is it, the show that started it all. Often imitated, but never equal. From San Francisco, USA, online since 2004, is the one and only rock and roll geek show. With the original rock and roll geek, Michael Butler. Welcome to the Rock and Roll Geek Show. My name is Michael Butler. Thanks a lot for joining me. I really appreciate it. Today is Wednesday, April 22nd, 2020, and it's 5.44 p.m. when I'm recording this intro. I just got off the phone with Tuck Smith, formerly the lead singer and songwriter of Biters. Now he's got a new record coming out called Tuck Smith and the Restless Hearts. Uh, I believe it's called Looking for Love, Ready for War. They're on the Motley Crue, Def Leppard's, Joan Jett Stadium Tour, and um, I've been wanting to talk to him for a while. I've always been a huge Biters fan, and as a lot of you have as well. Well, we talked for about an hour and a half, and I got some information that I was I was not expecting it to be as as uh, as what's the word. I was expecting to be interesting, but I was not expecting to get the information that I got. I thought it went really well, and I, he was a cool guy, and. I learned a lot about uh, <clears throat> a lot about the music business and and some good stories from Tuck Smith. So I hope you enjoyed this interview. Like I said, it went about an hour and a half, and uh, it was good. I I thoroughly enjoyed it. I I thought it was one of the um, more more open conversations I've had with a musician. And I always love when somebody opens up and just, and doesn't seem to be afraid to tell it like like really happened and it was i thoroughly enjoyed it so thank you tuck smith for coming on i really appreciate it man and uh thank you for listening friends i'm gonna shut up and i'm gonna play a song here's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna play a song then we will go into the tuck smith interview and then i'll close out the show with another song okay so let's start off with a song from biters we'll do an old song to start off with uh let me pull up my itunes i'm gonna play my favorite biters tune this song is called Indigo, and when he was on a label that they were going to record this album, and I played this song on a Rock and Roll Geek show a long time ago, and I got told to please pull this song down because it wasn't released yet, and they didn't want it to be out yet. Well, um, I asked Tuck if it be co- what songs it would be okay to play, and he said, I don't care what you play. So that's what I'm going to play. I'm going to play you my favorite Biter song to start off. Then we'll go into the Tuck Smith interview, and then we'll close out with another song. Thank you so much for listening, friends. Please keep the donations coming. I'm not going to name all the donors tonight. I will do that on a show, probably do a show on Saturday or Friday or Saturday, and I will thank everybody by name. But you know who you are. Please keep the donations coming. This is a value for value. So if you got any value out of this, please donate to the Rock and Roll Geek Show. Rockandrollgeek.com. There's a donate link and you can go there. And my livelihood depends on it, friends. So without your donations, this show will die a horrible, putrid, stench-filled death. And I probably will too. All right. I'm going to play a song and then we'll go right into the Tuck Smith interview. This song is called Indigo.
Thanks for having me, buddy. Stoked to be here. So where do you live? Are you where are you right now during the lockdown? I'm in Atlanta. Okay. Like right east Atlanta, yep. So are you do you live by yourself? You... No. I live with my wife and my dog. Oh, okay, and good. Where are you at? I'm in San Francisco, but I'm right now I escaped to the I have a place up in the mountains, so I escaped to the mountains while this bullshit's going on. I gotta go right, like what part of the mountains? Uh, you know where Trinity County is? It's so it's like Northern California. Yeah, no, it's like you get to Redding. It's kind of like between Redding and Eureka. Wow! So it's like four hours north of San Francisco. I have a place in San Francisco is where I live, and um, I got Wait, I escaped. Are you totally like sustainable out there right now, like mountain house? Uh, well, if I could hunt and fish better than I do, I'd be sustainable, but. Uh, Unfortunately, I'm not that great of a fisherman or a hunter, but, uh, no, you're a rock and roller. Yeah. yeah, I'm trying, but I'm not, I could, I'm, if I had to depend on hunting and fishing, I would have survived in the last year on one squirrel and one fish. So, oh my God. Wait, so how long ago have you caught a squirrel? Uh, when squirrel season was happening at, uh, the end of last or the beginning of this year, like two weeks before t- squirrel season, I shot one and cooked it up. It was actually the first squirrel I ever eat, ate, and it was really good. You ever eat squirrel? No, man. I mean, I'm from the <laughs> south. I'm a, I grew up in Redneck, so I never yeah. ate squirrel. I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, so I grew up in Redneckville, too. Oh, yeah. But I never even had a squirrel. That's funny. Yeah. It was surprisingly good, believe it or not. <laughs> well, you got a wild caught squirrel out in the mountains you're not fucking with like a, a city squirrel no it was it tasted delicious it was survived living <laughs> off nothing but acorns <laughs> um you know what's you know what's crazy is i really you have my dream situation i want to have like a self-sustainable house with well water and be in the middle of nowhere because you never know what's going to happen yeah. and uh it's scary when you really realize how dependent you are on the government and supply oh, please, chain. man in san francisco they're getting they're talking about shutting down the grocery stores it's crazy yeah <laughs> yeah we're we, our entire every our infrastructure is just we're we're different than we used to be we're just completely reliable on the system yeah. and it's fucking yeah. scary man. i know it is this place where i live up here where i have a house up here in the mountains it's i'm right off the river and it sucks water up from the river into these big tanks and the tanks or what um, provides the water to the house. So I don't have to provide, I don't have to depend on uh, the city for water. I do have to depend on for electricity, but it's not um, the normal California electrical company. It's a different company. Well, the thing is, man, I would, I would rather uh, be able to have my own water resource than electricity. I would rather be dependent because, so is this like a family house or? Uh, well, it's my wife and I got this house up here. We've been looking for a place for a long time. We finally found this place because I we want I want to get out of San Francisco for good, but I, unfortunately, I can't afford to because I have to work down in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, there's no there's nothing to do up there. You got to go fully off the grid. Yeah, and there's a couple. I'm in a couple bands down there, and uh, so all the gigs are down there too. Well, there's no gigs anywhere now. <laughs> Yeah, I know. But what are you gonna do? Well, dude, you? yeah, go ahead. You're honestly living the you're honestly living the dream, though, man. Yeah. That's something I, I'd want chickens and pigs and sh- well, maybe a couple goats, but yeah, you got it going on. I do want some chickens. Once I'm up here full time, I'm gonna have some chickens i just planted all these vegetables because i'm all freaked out about the world coming to an end so i planted all these vegetables i have to wait for like you know four months for them to be ready to eat but well the thing is if the world doesn't end and we go back to normal what else would you be doing right now exactly i'd be uh, so it's, it's not in vain yeah Hopefully we'll get back. Do you make your living? You make well, you, yeah. Of course you do. You all your money's made by touring and and stuff, right? Yeah, pro, uh, producing is a big income. Oh, that's right. Yeah, well, back you, catalog, publishing, songwriting for other people, all that shit. It's like a multifaceted thing. So, um, 
you still have money coming in then. Well, let me tell you this. Uh, the No, not really. Not at all. I mean, merch sales have been really good because I've been promoting the shit out of yeah. some uh, CDs. But I'll tell you what's really been really fucking helping me out, which was a surprise, is I've been doing these live streams. Right, yeah. And I, I didn't want to do them. It was never my personality. I thought it was always a little corny to kind of do it because I come from the school of rock and roll where you retain some kind of mystery. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, Bowie and all these people. But I started doing the live streams and people have been tipping me and it's really, really been supplementing my income for groceries and things like that. So super grateful that I'm able to do that, man. Yeah, pretty much all my income now is from this podcast since this bullshit started. Listeners it's came crazy. through and, and been showing their support, which I am so fucking grateful for. It's unbelievable. I know, dude. It's weird. The fans and, and the supporters, they make all of it go round. All of it, so it's it's very so who did who do you write songs for that you that you're making money on it well it's not just for but let's say like i go write uh a, i have a lot of songwriter buddies that i go write with like i'll go to la and nashville and if i don't use them for me i submit them and oh, things like God. that um so i got a couple like my label has a bunch of up and coming bands that always need songs. So anything I kind of have that I don't use, I turn in and you'll find out it's really strange because the, the kind of the school I came from was just playing, you know, the, the dive bars yeah, and stuff. Exactly. And, and then you kind of start getting a peek behind the curtains and you realize a lot of bands that get signed to kind of bigger labels and things, uh, young bands, a lot of them, they don't have like a, a really core kind of great songwriter. And what they do is they just kind of dish them out to, to songwriters. And you real I mean, we know it in the pop world that none of the pop writers right. really write their stuff, but on a rock level, it's really the same thing. It's super bizarre. Yeah. On mainstream our major label rock bands, but there's a lot, you know, you're not even major. Like you'd be surprised, like in the mid level stuff, the songs are written by like songwriters. Have you ever heard of a guy named Ginger Wildheart? Of course. Okay, good. That's good. Ginger. He's a yeah, dude. He was he offered to take biters on a Wildheart oh, really? store there. We just couldn't afford it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But didn't add up. That so. guy's probably one of the greatest songwriters of the, of our generation. I loved him. You know what I really liked? I don't think a lot of people like was that first Hey Hello record. Oh, oh yeah, both those Hey Hello records are good. Yeah, the first one, dude. Some of the yeah. hooks on there was like, oh. "Put your fist in the air." Yeah, that guy can write some catchy tunes. Well, you can write catchy tunes too. I was gonna say, uh, you and Ginger, probably the two guys who write the super catchy tunes. You ever hear of a guy named Jeff Whalen? Yeah, I wrote a song with him. Oh, you did on is it called, a year and a half ago? Is it on the new record coming out? No, it didn't make it. But you know, Sar, yeah, his band. Produced by that's, Rob Cavallo, that first record. Well, that's one of the reasons why, which is fucking crazy. Like everybody, I worked with Cavallo on this record. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it, it, I don't got to tell you his track record, but you know, My Chemical Romance, some of like even the Goo Goo Doll stuff that was kind of power pop, uh, you know, the big Green Day records, but that yeah. SAR record, I loved that <laughs> record. And I was really excited working with him solely on the SAR record. Exactly. Me too. I would, I would too. Cause that's a near perfect record. <laughs> You know what? Um, when I was talking to Rob about that, I asked him a lot about that record because I think it's one of the coolest records he's done. And I said, why do you think that record popped off? It had the big budget. Uh -huh. I thought it had the songs. R Cavallo said personally he thinks that lyrically he didn't know if Jeff wore his heart on his sleeve enough for people uh -huh. to relate. But, mm. but I mean that's a matter of opinion. He didn't know. So maybe um, they thought it was a little too camp, a little too tongue-in-cheek in camp. Like, I don't think it was the, the, the industry. I think the, the, the audience yeah, exactly. wasn't reacting. How did you it, get – go ahead. Know. Go ahead. No, no. I don't know. I just think that record is so good. It's one of my favorite Fantastic, records. Fantastic, man. Did you have that record when – did you just discover that record before you met Rob Cavallo, or did you already know of that record? I already knew it, but when I, lit, when I, when I knew I was going to start working with Rob, which we can get into that yeah. – uh, later but when i knew i was going to work with him i started kind of listening to some of his production because i've always made my own records with my buddy here right. in atlanta dan right. dixon uh -huh. and so i never worked really with many other people and i was i mean i had my inhibitions about i thought he's going to make me record stupid and i didn't know him man i thought i was going to be auto-tuned and 
I thought my record might be fucked up. So I started listening to some of his records. I'm like, this guy's made some really cool sounding mainstream records because American Idiot, whether you like Green Day or not, that record That is a fantastic great. record. It sounds great. Yeah. There's um, something about Rob Cavallo. That guy's probably one of the best producers in the world. Him, he's up there with, he's up there with Mutt Lang. He's huge. Yeah. <laughs> Um, he's I'm, huge. Yeah. So then I, his discography, I realized that he did that fucking star record. Yeah. That's how I and knew so it. That, that's, that's the first time I ever heard of Rob Cavallo was from that czar record. Dude, it's, I like their second record too. That's more lo-fi. Yeah. yeah. It's got some great tunes did you hear, on it. Did you hear Jeff Whalen's solo album that he put out last year? Of course. Year? Of course. <laughs> that album's yes. fucking so, great, man. Yeah. We wrote two songs together huh. uh, and I, I fished him out. Like it was hard kind of getting a hold of him and he's never written to anybody. And it was, I think he was reluctant. And like me, um, it's weird. I'm a fan. I was a fanboy, and I'm asking him all these questions. Oh. I was like, "Oh, what was it like touring Marvelous Three? And oh, what, what was it like working with Rob? And tell me this." And uh, he fucking when the records like didn't do good for Jeff, he said he was like sitting on a park bench and just had an epiphany to be a librarian, and he oh, just became yeah. a librarian. It was so fucking. Oh, is that weird. what he is now, a librarian? I think so. But we hung out for a couple days, and I had a a little Airbnb down in uh, Silver Lake. And he just, it was his old neighborhood and he came down there and we hung out for a couple yeah, days. That's where he lives two, in Sil Silver Lake. Yeah, we wrote two really good tunes. Huh. Uh, they did make the record because I wrote like 40 songs and, you really? know, you start getting, huh. every, you start getting everybody's opinion in the pot, which songs work. So, uh, still great songs though. So you got 40 songs written for this first album. Dude, I, <clears throat> I've been metaphorically <laughs> fucked in the ass by the music industry uh -huh. so bad <laughs> yeah i can yeah, we have, yeah. most people have but uh, I, would like, I mean i would like to hear how you got metaphorically fucked in the well ass, i just i every dude there's been so many points in my life where i have thought ah, man i tried hard as i could i can you know on my deathbed i'll know that i gave it my all i'll just hang up my hat and call it a day I can bow out gracefully. You know what I mean? And every time I go to do that, something happens. And so when biters, which I can't really get into the reason why biters had to break up. But well, when I, I was, heard, I'll tell you why I heard uh, that the biters didn't want to put or the record label. I don't know what the record label was, but big something big. big I don't know. I don't know what the record label. That doesn't not ear, earache record. Earache. Yeah. That's it. I heard they didn't want to do the next record and they wouldn't let you do another record without, they didn't want to put out your record and they wouldn't let you put out a record. So they kind of owned you. No, not, no, that, no, that's not what happened. Right. No, no, they, they, we were, it's such a long story. And it, before legal reasons, uh, the lawsuit and stuff I went through with them <laughs> ru ruined it, dude. It ruined. I never been so low depressed it, it, and defeated it in my life. It, and I don't want, I just want to forget about them, it, but I will say they would not let me go and they would not let biters do another record. They would not let me do another record. The only way for me to continue as a musician was to break biters up. You know, that is fucking so I don't get it. Why record? It's a not. That's not a different story than a lot of bands have gone through, and it's kind of a typical story with record labels. I don't get why they won't put out a record and won't let you do another record. It's just ridiculous to me. <laughs> well, they, it, they, yeah. No, go ahead. Sorry. It also it puts a it makes you it goes yeah. against everything you even started playing music for to begin with. When you when you start dealing with oh no, I got to go hire lawyers and it kind of just like. Uh, why did I even start playing? Dude, I don't know anything about like business or stuff. And I don't like, or I just want to make music and tour. Yeah. But I, I will say this. Eric did a lot of good for me. I'm not hating on him. But by I any would. Means. <laughs> but, 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 but when the relationship went sour for numerous reasons, numerous little things. And you know how relationships, they start to just kind of chip away. And before you know it, you're at a, a point of no return and you can never fix it. Yeah, yeah. So me, I was really trying, I was trying to give them another biters record to let me go. I said, give me, g give it. And then they kind of got into a pissing contest and they were really, really spiteful. Um, but they financially ruined me. The band had to break up and not to mention the biters internally because of the record label and how raggedy we were and 
no money. We were fighting crazy, and I think everybody needed a break, and people wanted to move on. Oh. It was actually time for the band to move on and everybody kind of started having different goals and, right. and different things. So everything happens for a reason. How long does the record label own the buyers? I mean, like I'm I, I don't want to get into the thing, but those records I put out on Eric, if a dimension portal opens up to another world tomorrow, they'll own them in that dimension. So they own them in perpetuity, I'm guessing. Yeah, I just I had to just say take it right up now, there. What if you got the guy I'm I'm I know you have the new band and everything and want that to be a success. But it, you know, Biters fans <coughs> Biters had a lot of huge fans. My friend Jasper and I saw you guys at South by Southwest when you were the you heart. Come up, when, plan nine, Jasper. Yeah, Jasper Plan Nine, my buddy Jasper. He's a yeah. he's a great guy. Yeah, he's a cool guy. I love Jasper. <laughs> And then, uh, we saw you guys when you were the heart, when it was the heart attacks. And then shortly after we saw you guys several times with the biters. That's not, a, I forgot what I was even saying now, but, uh, biters have a lot of fans when, you know, a lot of people love the biters <clears throat> and after this, the tuck Smith and restless heart, maybe years and and you decide you want to reform the biters, just do a couple of biters gigs. Uh, could you read the, rename the band? Like, I don't know the, um, <laughs> the bitters or something like that well the thing is i can play out so there's there's nothing against me playing out i just can't r release a name under the biters any new music if something happens and in five years i i told the guys i said we're gonna do a reunion one day down the line but i but i just gotta put this shit and keep moving forward but i will say that um I don't know, man. I don't know what they're going to do. If my record does really well, I they might re-release the biter stuff again to get caught up uh -huh, in right. the thing, <laughs> which is fine. Because, man, at, oh, at this point in my in, in my life and the shit I've dealt with, I can't hold a grudge long. And so, like, it the, holding on to hate and that being vindictive and stuff, yeah, I just can't do it. Sure. I just had to move on. That was all. It sucked. <clears throat> is your wife? Have you? How long you been married? Uh, a couple years. Oh, okay, so she was she with you when you were in the bot when you had biters? Yeah. Okay. Did you produce that uh, Ravagers record? The one I, I just produced the new one. It hasn't come out yet. Okay. And you produced um, the new Ravagers record. Uh -huh. no, fucking, you're gonna be blown away. Oh, I that, promise you. Did you do a wildlife record? I did. I didn't do the one that came out last week, but I did the two before. Yeah, the one before, uh, the uh, Out on Your Block, that was my second favorite album of the year. That was a great album. The new one's you. fantastic. Have you heard the new one? I did. I really like it. Um, you know, I we were talking about doing that record. I was going to produce it because it's not like there's any hard feelings, but they're on Little Steven's label. Yeah, right. And, you know, when you when you move, they have their own guys, right. their own producers. Right. And it, it does cost more for them to stay in Atlanta for three weeks. And so... You know, there's no hard feelings. They're still my friends. I support them. I, I love the record. I, do I wish I could have did it? Yes. So, do but, you do all the all the all of your records that you produce? You you do them all in the same studio? Well, I like using my engineer Dan yeah. because I feel like when you form bonds and friendships with people, uh, it just comes out, and I can kind of say, "Do that thing to the vocals, Dan, that I want," and he knows automatically. So there's a camaraderie. Um, yeah, you're a team. Yeah, but you know, if there was a band in LA I wanted to work with or something, and uh, I know some people out there, like the 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 guy who engineered my record, my solo record, Doug McKean, I would definitely make a record with him engineering if I was in LA. So um, I just got to trust people that know the history of rock and roll and know the sounds. So you make decent money producing. Uh, it, nobody's getting rich off of it. I can tell you that. <laughs> All right, but it's it's. Something. So, did your does your well? If uh, I, I I produced like four or five EPs last year, uh -huh. like I like in between you, buyers and this, like I did this band Prowess, uh -huh. I did band Fest Eddie, I did Ravagers, mm -hmm. I did uh, I can't even remember all what I did. did I did, you do, uh, uh, did Bad you, Mother. Did you do Rambler? No, I did not. Okay. Ch me and Chase. Yeah. Uh, well, I love him, but he. I don't think we could work together and he has his own idea. So. <laughs> uh -huh, yeah, they have uh, the wildlife has a song about him on their new record. Yeah, I know. It's funny. Yeah, it's, great it's so too. funny. <laughs> we had I just did. I just had him on the show last week. Um, uh, Dave. Chase? Da no, Dave, oh, Dave, Dave, not Chase. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be yeah, kind I'm... of afraid to hang out with that Chase guy. He seems like a loose cannon. He seems like uh, you might get no, into a bar fight no. or two. No, dude, we grew up together. Me and Chase. 
I love him. He's fine. When we he's saw funniest, we saw funniest motherfucker. Yeah, he's hilarious. When we saw Heart Attacks at South by Southwest, me and Jasper and I, um, I thought there was gonna be a couple of fights on stage. It was quite entertaining. Not the fights between band members, but a fight but fights between uh, band and audience. Dude, um, uh, when you're a teenager and you get signed to like Hellcat. Oh, is that the and label the Hellcat? Yeah. Yeah, like we got signed by the guy from Ranton. Yeah. We were all teenagers. I'm telling you right now, your brain isn't fully developed. And I mean, what a bunch of fucking jackass knuckleheads. Yeah, but it was fun, wasn't it? You always remember it, those fun times. I don't remember shit, dude. I was <laughs> fucking doing so much drugs and partying. Uh, I I didn't do anything to accomplish rock and roll. And then when that band broke up and I started Biters, I felt like I was like making up for lost time. <clears throat> I was like punished. I was like, you know, when the uh, Catholics like jack off or something and they feel bad and they, they whoop their own backs <laughs> ass with a leather strap. <laughs> No, but okay, I get it. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, I do. Yes. Yeah, to me I was like punishing myself. I'm like, get better, get focused. Uh-huh. So, yeah, it's funny. You still drink now or anything? Yeah, yeah, I drink. Yeah. I, I just don't party like I used to. Super goal oriented, man. I got obsessed with like I don't know what happened. I just fucking got really kind of hyper focused and obsessed with everything rock and roll musical. So. Yeah, so you just buckled down and just started writing tunes. Did you now did you like just I, I'm assuming you wrote most of the tunes in Heart Attacks too, right? Or did you? No, no. Actually, I, you know, uh, I think on that record I've got like four or five songs writing credit, but it was all guitar. I was honestly sniffing so much cocaine and, and partying and worried about the lifestyle that I didn't really do shit or give a fuck about anything. Um, it, was, and it was fun and it was cool, but it was a complete waste of time as far as being creative or like learning your craft. Once I started – Poison Arrows, uh, me and the bass player Portwood from 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 Heart Attacks, mm-hmm. we co-wrote all those songs, and he was actually a, a great writer. And now he's in a, a drug induced uh, coma for a while, and huh. woke up and he can't walk. It's permanent. He's permanently what brain damaged. Fuck? Holy shit! From doing drugs, of course. <laughs> wow. So well, I mean, we can we can get into depths and all the cautionary tale rock and roll, which, nah. which sucks. <laughs> but I don't want to. Yeah. But I will say once I figured out what made bands great and just okay, once I learned that it was songs, it was like a door opened up. And, and, and then I realized that that's like a trade you kind of have to work on and figure out. It does come naturally, but I figure like hard work will beat talent any day. So I just got obsessed with it. So did you – did you – so so, how did you start writing tunes? Did you just start playing tunes, or did you listen to songs and just like like maybe listen to a T Rex record or whatever sweet sweet record or something uh, and uh, and try to like start playing those and then do a variation of it? How did you start coming up with catchy well, tunes? I think that when heart attacks broke up due to drugs, jail, fuck it, mental institutions, like <laughs> that that just did not end well. It was so reckless and so self-destructive on everybody's part i think i had like this really big chip on my shoulder to kind of prove everybody that i could do it myself and so i kind of used that chip on my shoulder to say i can do this and i could already write like bodies of uh music that was easy but it was the lyrics that i didn't know how to write so you could write so you could come up with catchy melodies like vocal melodies but not just not the lyrics i just I just couldn't come up with lyrics and the riffs. And so I started writing with my buddy Portwood and I would come up with like choruses, like on poison arrow stuff. I would come up with like the chorus, but I had no confidence. I was kind of like just fucking Mm -hmm. shooting in the dark. And I feel like songwriting, if you really want to do it, you got to practice. You got to want to do it. And you got to want to do the stuff that isn't fun. Like writing lyrics isn't as fun as doing cool riffs. So for a guy trying to so to tell a song, a guy who wants to write tunes, <clears throat> say he's in just like a cover band or whatever, not he wants to start writing an original band, you would just tell him, what would you tell him? Do you just write songs and write songs even if they suck and just keep writing tunes or to listen yeah, to Yeah, you got it. Yeah, you got, Well, here's the thing. Here's there's like an X factor I think with songwriters like Mick Jagger could sing a lyric that somebody else could sing and would sound dumb and stupid, but he can make it cool. Huh. So there's like this x factor with certain people that just make stuff cool when they do it 
Like, I, I don't think I can sing Bon Scott lyrics with a straight face. Uh huh. Yeah, I can get that. But because they're kind of like, I honestly, if I sang I'm on the highway to hell, I would feel like a cheese ball. But he can do it. <laughs> yeah. So you got to find your own voice and, and, and make it authentic. And I think if you do it, off, if you can make what you're saying authentic, I think that kind of shines through. But I don't, honestly, at the end of the day, I don't fucking know, man. Do you, uh, so you just sit down with the guitar and just come up with a tune? I wish it was that easy. I will say that it never gets easier. Because you came up with 40 songs for this new record. How long did it take you to write 40 tunes? Good. While I was on tour with Biters 2017, the tail end, you know, like December, yeah. so like right at 2018, yeah. I started writing, like laying in the tour bus. We were on tour with him, and I remember having demos and writing lyrics. You were on tour with you were on tour with who? Him. Oh, you H I M that guy. Yeah. Huh. Uh, with biters, yeah, huge. Yeah. Five, yeah. six, seven, eight thousand people. Yeah, that guy's Zero huge in, in overseas. Yeah, I would be on a tour with him, biters. There'd be no tour support, no press, no money, nothing, no support from the label at all. So you could see like how that started dwindling away that relationship. Yeah. But yeah, I wrote so much, man, that I I really think I burned like a, a, a some kind of rut in my in my neurological pathways. It, it really damaged me uh, using my brain that much. And I would I have a little home studio, and I would stay up here uh, 60, 70 hours a week, and I would just I would be so crazy on caffeine. I would just piss in jugs, man. At one point, I probably had like five or six gallon jugs in the corner just filled with piss. I didn't move. Because huh. I didn't want to fuck my shot up. I was like, if I'm whatever in the universe is giving me another shot to carry on after biters and do a record with Cavallo and keep going, I've got to make sure that I have some really, really good, great, marketable rock and roll songs. So when biters, I just went to town. When biters broke up, so you got a, you got a, Ricky Dover came in the band. I guess that was on the last. I, I will say this, Mr. Butler, this yeah. is the most in-depth heart on my sleeve I've ever talked in well, an in interview. Well, I feel I very honored. <laughs> I don't know why you're pulling this out of me. <laughs> uh, how did you meet? So I guess you met uh, Ricky when he was in The Tip because you guys were going to play with The you could, We were going to produce The Tip. So how did you get Well, Ricky? I met him in the booze. I met him in the booze. Oh, okay. I don't know that band. So that was his They're band. an Atlanta band. They're very uh, kind of mod, late 60s, early 70s. Is he uh, from Atlanta? No, he's in Nashville, but my friend Randy Michael, uh, you know the band Mateel? She's mm. a huge kind of indie. He, he produces and stuff in Atlanta, and he's been in a tons of bands. He played in Curtis Harding. But Ricky was in that band, The Booze, and the Biters and the Booze used to tour together in okay. the same band mm -hmm. in the early 2010s together. Hmm. So, uh, And then Ricky was in Bird Wings okay. as well. So you um... – so you got Ricky was every so everything was in, was not going good when you had Ricky in, the, in playing bass because he was a good, wow. fucking great guitar player and then he moved to bass so things were not going good when he was playing bass. Well, we did a Blackberry Smoke tour oh, in that's, Europe. That's a good the Biters, uh -huh. yeah, great tours. No thanks to fucking. But I will say, uh, the bass player and Biters quit three weeks before uh, a U.S album uh release tour was that your brother or is your brother the drummer my brother was in the biters before and he he left because he didn't like touring and i got my buddy philip in so the middle bass player quit like three weeks before a tour and i was like dude if you want to quit i understand this is not for everybody it's a difficult lifestyle yeah, i'll never if anybody ever wants to quit like you can't hold them against them if they're not happy and they want to have some sort of stability. But he dipped like three weeks before the tour and kind of left me with my finger in my ass. Uh -huh. And I'm like, and I'm like, I'm like, can you finish it? So I was like really desperate. And I called Ricky and I said, Hey man, I know you're in Nashville. Um, and you know, all these musicians, do you know any bass players, touring bass players that'll join the band for this tour? And he goes, yeah, I'll ask around, blah, 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 blah. And about 20 minutes later, he goes, actually, uh, I've been playing bass quite a bit. And, um, yeah, I'm not playing with a tip anymore, so I'm down to give it a shot. Oh. I was like, really? All right, you're in. Oh, so he quit the tip before he joined you guys. I did not know that, huh? 
So I with, don't know. I didn't ask. Went south. It was just so funny how he goes. Yeah, I'll be, keep an eye out for musicians. And then literally twenty minutes later, he's huh. like, "Actually, I've been playing bass oh. quite a bit." Like, oh, that's good. <laughs> so we're so things were not going good when he was in the band. Did you guys make any? I mean, you got on these good tours. Were you getting paid well enough? To no, have, not in Europe. No. Huh. No, I we were touring in the U.S and making enough money to fund the European tours. I was putting on personal credit cards, $10,000 a tour. I would, we would go about 10 to $18,000 in debt on every European tour. And we would tour the States huh. to pay back the debt for Europe. Cause a lot of bands, uh, uh you know, like there's Dan, I don't know if you know who Dan Baird is, but he's, um, <clears throat> he was in, he was in, uh, Georgia satellites and, um, yeah. He's he he stopped touring now, but anyway, bands could like that do well in Europe, and they just play Europe and play Europe, and they make their money just by touring Europe. So they get all all the money's in Europe. Well, yes, you can make money in Europe, but the thing is, you gotta you've got to eat shit for a little bit, right? So you got to do the support tours, which you're not getting so paid. Support tours on you make did uh, earache take merch money too? No, but they charge astronomical amounts for wholesale. So you had to go through Earache to get merch made, like T-shirts. Well, for the, for oh, the no, for your CDs, CDs. You, to sell no, CDs. No T-shirts. Yeah. So T-shirts, I I would have to hire a company over there to front us, right? Uh huh. But think about this: you're paying seven fifty for a shirt. You sell them for twenty. You give the venues a cut. Then you pay your merch person. Then you got like because $5. of the level of venues, you had to pay pay venues for merch. Because when the punk yeah, rock I, level, the be, the venues don't no, want to take. And them. a lot of and a lot of Live Nation places, even they they. See in Europe, it's different. You can have a two hundred, three hundred cap club that's Live Nation style. Uh huh. Yeah. That's yeah. corporate. Right. So and then so we would make money on merch a lot, and then it would go back because you got to think, the guy like you're talking about, he probably has his own gear over there. He's toured enough to have his own gear, and he probably has his markets where you can get a great guarantee. But you start adding up plane tickets, you got five to seven thousand dollars a plane plane ticket. You got a couple thousand dollars in rental gear. You got to rent all different stuff. Then you got to have a vehicle. You got to have a driver. If you're touring Europe, you got to have a bilingual guy or whatever. So you need at least two crew. And then you got to have a place for seven people to sleep every night. And so that shit adds up super quick, yeah. man. Yeah. It probably costs more to be on bigger tours too, I would, I guess. Way more. And the sleep deprivations is absolutely unreal because they're all in a tour bus and you're like in a little splinter van. Right, yeah. And so you can't drive all night. So a lot of those European tours, like we did Jan Danko Jones. We did the Kerrang Sum 41 tour. We did Blackberry Smoke. We did him. All those kind of tours, man, I was sleeping about three hours a night and it, it fucks with you so bad. And you, you just fight with everybody and you're delirious and you're just dumb as fuck and you don't know what you're doing and you're sick the whole time. Um, but it was all to, to kind of build and blaze a trail. It's almost like Vikings. You go over there and you have to go fucking pillage for a while and set up your kingdom. And so that's what I was trying to do. And I, I was definitely going into debt really bad. Yeah. So almost. So biters break up, or you 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 kill the biters due to whatever legal reasons. And how long before you uh, started working on? I'm assuming you just said, "Fuck it, I'm going solo. I'm going to start writing tunes now." But how long? I had you, to. How yeah. how long before the wheels came in motion, business wise, for Tuck Smith and the Restless Hearts? Well, I had a bunch of. I was meeting with Cavallo a bunch. Oh, how'd you meet I, him? How did that come about? You want to hear a crazy small story? It's fucking crazy. So my manager lives in LA. This is like a weird conspiracy thing. My manager <laughs> lives in LA and he was at a golf course. Uh -huh. And and then in the locker room, Rob Cavallo was in there like butt naked out of the shower. And my manager's like, Rob Cavallo? And he's like, yeah. He goes, oh, I'm John Greenberg. You might not know me, but we have a lot of mutuals. And he's like, you producing any rock bands? And he goes, no, but I'm really looking for somebody to produce that's huh. rock and roll. You know anybody? Huh. My manager goes, I got the perfect guy. You Fuck. know what You know what that's called? That's the secret. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude. I, just fucking did, I, I did the secret. Um, law of attraction, which I practice yeah. that. You talk about visualization every single night. Huh. Um, I've always wanted to work with Rob, but I do know that um, – you know, and then my manager just bothered, got Rob's number and bothered the fuck 
out of Rob until he agreed to meet me. So, so let me interrupt. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. Isn't he no. an ex- isn't he an expensive producer? <laughs> yeah. Yes. I mean, yes. you maxed out your credit cards supporting uh, no. paying for the biters. How do you afford him? Well, no, here I would max out my credit credit cards with the biters, and then we would turn to the U.S. and pay it back over time. So, and, and when I mean maxed out, I mean hold on one second. Let me crack a beer. Since we're going deep, yeah. Okay, I'll I'll join uh, I'll join you. I'll crack one too. I'm cracking a beer. This what are you drinking? Uh, I'm drinking a Dos Equis. But listen, okay. I'm drinking a Tecate. The, so we're this is the deepest I've ever went. This information. Okay, good. I've never talked good. That's <laughs> what I like. So with with Cavallo, I mean, if you're putting ten thousand dollars on your credit card, you can pay that back in a couple, you know, six months, eight months on tour. Well, you can. Okay, yeah, okay. Well, right. I'm saying we tour. Biters toured a lot. Yeah. So. Anyways, so Rob decided to meet me, but what was weird is, at, and, and, and Rob told my manager he didn't know who the biters were and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. But then as we recorded, because mm-hmm. you know these people are so secretive, it's like this own elite thing. Rob would talk about how Billy Joe would come, Billy Joe from Green Day would come into the um, studio wearing biter shirts all the time, mm-hmm. okay. and I and I know I know that my friend Todd Youth, uh, when we were touring with Degeneration, uh, may he rest gave, in peace. Yeah, I love Todd. Good buddy. He he gave uh, Cavallo in like 2012 or 13 uh, all chewed up Biters record. And the next day we played San Francisco. Warner Brothers called Matt Gabs' phone and asked us to come to the office in L.A. Huh. And we couldn't make it. And the next thing you know, my manager I had at the time got into it and fucked it all up. So I knew Cavallo <laughs> was uh, aware of the Biters and through Billy Joe and through Todd Youth and some other people, but he act like he didn't know till later on, till he had heard of the biters. So it's this really weird coincidence and a long time coming kind of thing. So, okay, so your manager meets him, and uh, did you guys? So did you you? So you flew out to L.A. to meet with Rob Cavallo. So, so when we do the behind the music, you're definitely going to be the interview. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. I'll hold you to that. So, so let's hope the yeah, record so, is a huge success. So you get a behind the music. I hope so, man. I'm set up for it. So we, uh, so, so you got to think about this lawsuit with earache. I'm still going through the lawsuit after the biters is done hmm. and I'm stacked with fucking lawyers bills, just completely shattered. Uh-huh. Um, they're calling me every week. My manager is like, we're going to figure this out. He's a super great, positive guy. And Cavallo wants to meet me while I'm still in this uh, lawsuit. I'm flat broke, and I have no idea what I'm going to do with my life because I'm just so hopeless. And you know when you get depressed in weird situations, you can't really think clearly because yeah. you're just in your own hole. It I was, turns I into was, a spiral. I was definitely way, 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 way down the, the, the rabbit hole. So – my manager said, Cavallo wants to meet you. And I'm like, well, I don't have any money. I have nothing going on. And he goes, you got your credit card? I said, yeah. So <laughs> I just put, put more of it on the fucking credit card and went out to L.A. So, uh, you, put, so you put plane ticket on the credit card, not production. And an Airbnb. Okay, you put your travel No, this is, this is early. I developed my relationship with Rob for months, man. It didn't happen immediately. Oh. He just the first time I ever met him. He didn't hear songs. And I went, this is fucking crazy. How did the I first meeting go? What, what was the very first you sentence know, it's that was crazy. said? You want to know? Yeah. It's like I flew into L.A. Uh, and I set up a couple writing sessions with people I knew. One of them was my buddy Keith Nelson from Buck Cherry, uh-huh. uh, which he quit Buck Cherry, but he's dude. I know he writes a lot for of a lot say, of people. I know that people say talk shit on Buck Cherry, but Keith is amazing. He's got a great taste in music and a great ear. So um, he's the real deal. So uh, I set up some some writing with him and a, and a couple other people I knew just to make the trip worthwhile, right? Just so I didn't go out there because right. yeah. So, so, okay, so and I'm you can write off that plane ticket too if you do your taxes. Y- yeah, yeah. So I- I'm trying to stay positive and, and trying to enjoy it because LA is super inspiring. So we go to LA. I meet my manager in front of Capitol Records, the big stacked building, the mm-hmm. famous one. Yeah. It's like 2 p.m. <laughs> we go up the fucking elevator where the Beatles. Oh, so have you're been. meeting Rob Cavallo at Capitol Records? <laughs> yes. I wonder why he said. Did he call the meeting there? Does he work for Capital? Is he at an office he has, in Capital? He has a he has a subsidiary label there. Yeah. 
No, so that he has an office there, huh? How about that? Yeah, he has a re- he has a record label what, there. And what's so his label called? I don't fucking know. Five oh seven or oh, okay. something. I don't fucking know. It's a subsidiary of Capital. So we go way high up to his office, and you know he's got a beautiful twenty-one year old assistant, Danny Pincus, which uh-huh. worked on the record. Uh-huh. And you walk into his office, and there's a Green Day American Idiot plaque with records on the wall. But it's so many gold records or whatever, platinum, that it takes up the whole fucking wall. Uh-huh. Just a green like, day. Dude, it, dude, it, dude, dude, it's just, just American Idiot. It's like there's 12 or 15 records huh. inside the plant. It covers that? a whole wall. You, you know what I mean? Because they it, it sold like yeah. 12 million copies or something. And there's my chemical. There's all these hit records and stuff. And he comes in there. And I just remember it was so clean and so nice. And I'm wearing like this ratted out like sweet shirt and some dirty converse and i'm like god i'm like such a i well, feel so that's crazy. what that would impress him i would imagine <laughs> yeah but i just made me feel so dirty so we just sat down and we talked about what was going on with biters and he was just kind of picking my brain and asking me things and they ordered lunch catered from there's a restaurant inside capital oh, makes stuff. you got a good lunch, uh, a lunch out of it good yeah well yeah i was nervous man because i'm like fuck because i don't but i didn't have my heart set on it so we talked for like two hours Huh. That day in his in his office, just about stuff. And uh, my manager was talking. What stuff. kind and, you of know, stuff? When, what kind of stuff? Me, my manager. You know, my manager and other like record people. They always like do pissing contests. Oh, I used to work with Steven Tyler and then oh, Jeff McKagan. Oh, oh so I you know got him. the bragging of the bragging of the track records. That's out what of the they way do. To start, yeah. They they do that, and I'm sitting there. Um, so we're talking. I was talking about you know I love Cheap Trick and this and these records and. He hasn't heard any songs, any demos. He supposedly hasn't heard Biters before. Uh huh. But he was bullshitting you. I I guess. I mean, you got to think if you're that much of a big producer, I would be guarded yeah, too. He's got. Right? He's playing his his playing. He's playing it cool. He's guarded. Say. So we talk for a while, and nothing happens. He's like, "Okay, well, it was nice meeting you. We oh. leave, right?" So we go out to the parking lot, and in front of Capitol, I made my manager take a picture of me out in front. It's on my Instagram. And I'm like standing in front of Capitol Records. And I told my manager, I said, get a picture of me because I'm never coming back here. I said, he doesn't like me, man. He doesn't give a shit about me. It was great to meet him. I really want to make a record with him. But I just could tell he wasn't vibing with me. And it just, whatever, right? I wanted him, I wanted to go faster and be like, let's, let's, let, let's get in here and hear demos and stuff. So I kind of left disheartened but i didn't have my hopes up too high because you know that's a, a long shot right yeah to do a record with him um so and i go that, to my buddy that's Keith. a little bit of a mind fuck by a producer too you know to uh <clears throat> to put a guy through that but go ahead well he wasn't being rude or anything yeah, he just met with me i know yeah and i didn't know i didn't know what was going to expect to happen well, go ahead. He didn't know. He, he didn't know that I just fucking rented an Airbnb and a plane ticket and went out there. It was a huge thing to me. It was a regular Tuesday to him. Yeah, he thought you were just like, yeah, go ahead. So, am I boring you with the story? Oh, absolutely not. This is what I'm into. I'm way into this so, shit. Man. So, so I, I tell my manager, yeah, he's the nicest guy. He's been with me through Biters. He's helped me through everything. I said, John. I said, I really appreciate you so much, man. You you stuck with me through this whole lawsuit. And you helped me meet with Cavallo, but he doesn't like me. I said, he's not going to call me. I'm going to try to, I think we should go with plan B. And my manager goes, Tuck, are you fucking kidding me, dude? He goes, you know how busy he is? He said, do you know how many people have probably called him when he was in that meeting? He didn't answer. That man just met you for two fucking hours. Yeah, he, if he didn't two hours. Meet, that's pretty, that's yeah, pretty impressive. He, my manager said, if he didn't want to meet with you, he would have his assistant come in there and say, you have a meeting. You need to go. He goes, just wait. I don't fucking know because I don't play games like that. So I went to my buddy Keith for writing, and uh, I'm like, oh, dude, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm fucked. My band's broke up. I'm fucking in debt with a lawsuit. You know, I'm just whining and complaining. Uh-huh. And my Keith's like, buddy, let's just write some songs and keep our head down and, and move forward. And as we're in the writing session, Rob texts me and goes, hey, man, can you come over to my house about 9 or 9.30 tonight and bring your guitar? I want you to hear some of your songs. Huh. Bring your guitar. I want you to hear some of your songs. So I want you to sit in front of me and play like a dancing bear. So, so the only thing, <laughs> and I'm like, holy shit. 
but I'm not nervous because I've met yeah. these people. In, what have in, you got to tour. lose? Yeah, but like I, I do want to do this. I really, it was always been a dream of mine to make a record with him. So, so you guys think about me from Atlanta, what I've done, where I just came from. I go to Sherman Oaks and, and pull up to this fucking. I don't even know how much the house costs. Dude. Yeah, it's a nice. Place. I'm in like my little <laughs> rental, sixty five dollar a day rental kit. Right. Yeah, I get it. And there's a code. There's a code to get in. Does he have a butler? And Mercedes and shit. No, no, he's super down earth, <laughs> dude. He's awesome. He's a, he's the coolest one of the coolest guys, Kabbalah. And I go to his house. How great would it be if he had slaves? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that would not be great. Go ahead. <laughs> so. I go, I, I go in there, and I got my fucking, you know, little guitar. You brought an acoustic, or what? what I did brought you... it to right. Yeah, I brought it to right. Acoustic. I, I, I fly with it. It, uh-huh. it got smashed uh, about a year later in the airport, American Airlines. But you know, it was like a, a, a seventies Alvarez. I don't fucking uh-huh. know. So we go into right. his house, and he's like, "Hey, how you doing? Come on in." <laughs> <laughs> it's huge. Did and you like, uh, did, did you at any point think is this guy gay? Is he hitting on me? No, okay, no. Good, good. Super, <laughs> nice, and, and he's, you can tell he's so fucking smart that you can't read. Yeah, him. yeah. He's g- he's genius, genius level. Yeah, I can. So see I'm like, that. does guy think I'm cool or think I'm a fucking bitch? I would been sh- so, I would I would have been shaking. Was your manager with you? No, no, no. no You're no, by no. yourself. Yeah, I don't give a fuck. Yeah, it's I would have my I pants. Put, no, so I it was just weird the situ the setting. If yeah. he would have came to like a show and saw me play like a rock and roll show or you know where people are crazy, he'd be in my element, be like, yeah. right? But He's like on your I'm turf. in his house, yeah, but I'm on his turf. And I just remember like his son is watching TV on like the nicest most dude. I don't even know how much the couch costs. Uh-huh, He's got a right. dead Kennedy shirt on. Oh really? And I'm huh. like, yeah. And I'm like, what the fuck? So his wife's in there. She's so fucking nice, and um. He's like, well, come on, let's go in this back room. And so I get into the back room, this little dude, it's so fucking small, like a listening room. You could tell they just moved into the house. Nothing was in there. Like he had no pro. I said, do you have pro tools in here? Do you have stuff? He goes, oh, I don't run pro tools. I don't, I don't, I don't do that. Huh. I don't have anything. He does so, all, uh, all, all analog. Dude. No, no, no. Okay. He's just he just doesn't have school. that at his house. No, he don't do it. He's just a producer, not an engineer. Ah, oh, got it. Got it. <laughs> so. I literally, we talked for a second, and he made me some peppermint tea. It was so weird. <laughs> I've not, I've Would you like done, some I've, peppermint tea, Tuck? Well, I wanted caffeine, <laughs> so yes. He goes, oh, I'll get you the good shit, the PNG tea. So we sit down, and he's being super cool, and I just get my guitar, and he goes, all right, so play me some songs. Huh. So, Were you shaking and, or anything? Were you just to- totally cool with it? I'm not shaking, but I'm also like when it goes in the fight or flight, I usually fight. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm fine. I'm just so used to being under pressure and things, wow. and I'm That's like, like Fuck it. unbelievable. Go ahead. I'm loving this story. Well, this is before I was really like doing a lot of acoustic shows and things like that, so I wasn't like really prepared to like sit down with acoustic and play, which is what I do all the time writing. So I said, "Well, Rob, <laughs> I'm gonna kind of pl- kind of play these kind of in a low key." So I'm not like screaming. It's like 10 o'clock at night. He's got kids and shit. Now, were these to... were these new songs you played him or old songs? Biters tunes. No biters. No, no, no. He All wanted to hear what song. I got. Okay. Yeah, of course. Because he he goes, what you got? Let me hear your songs. Um, No demos, which I had demos and stuff. So this motherfucker says, do this. So you know what the first song I played him was? Uh, Was it a cover? What? No, it was What Kind of Love. Okay. All right. No, he only wanted to hear originals. He, hmm. he didn't want to hear my skill. Yeah. He wanted to hear me if I had tunes. Huh. So the first single is what you play him. I played him What Kind of Love on Acoustic. <clears throat> and he goes, man, that's really good. That's oh. like Mellencamp. Wow. I was like, cool. That's a compliment. Like, For me, because I love Mellencamp. That's what Hell I yeah. Fuck yeah, I was man. Do, I was trying to do Mellencamp meets like Cheap Trick Joan Jett. Uh-huh. So he goes, wow, that's great. He goes, play it again. Played it again. He goes, I really like that. And he it's goes, a simple song, just three chords. Well, that's what he wants. Uh-huh. That's what they're that's what they're looking for. So I, uh, he goes, do me a favor. <clears throat> I want right now at the top of your head. I want you to play it, but when you get to the chorus, I want you to come up with a different chorus. Huh, what? So no, but I do this all the time. 
And so I get to a part and I wrote maybe even a better course than the one we have now. So wait a minute. So what was the original course? Was the original course what kind of love? Yeah, I used the same words, but I came up on the spot a different melody and different chords. Hmm. I went to an E minor. I remember what I did. And he goes, wow, that's really good. Now can you play it in 6-8 time? Did you know what 6-8 time was? Yeah, yeah, because I programmed drums all day on Pro oh, Tools. Oh, okay. Pretty strict. Right. So, um, so I played it in 6-8 time. He goes, nice. <sighs> you, he says, you can just, he goes, you can just do that? I this said, yeah. This fucking dude's putting you through a test, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then he goes, now play it again and do a different chorus, but I want you to go to this chord. What the hell? And so I did it. And it sounded really good, but I was like in a moment, uh, I was dialed into some kind of frequency. I feel because I was just, I felt so good because I was in my wheelhouse. Oh, you must have came out of there feeling like, man, I'm a fucking badass. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what I felt like because you got to understand sitting at, sitting on a chair with a guitar is where hunched over inside of myself is probably like where I spend the majority of my time. So, okay, that, so he told you to do I'm it. Talking. He told you to do the chorus different the third time. So, what did you do yeah. the third time with the chorus? He wanted me to go to a different chord. A different chord. Okay. So, what yeah, a different do? chord. I can't remember. And then he goes, "Cool. What else you got?" <laughs> then I played him. Then I played him. I played him another song, and he goes, "Fuck, that's really good." He said, "That's like because the night, Patty Smith." I what said, song I know. was it? It didn't make the record. So, I don't know why. I can get into that later, but he said, play it again. So it was like, because the night was more of a ballad. No, I've smashed it out. Like it was a, like same kind of feel the same cut feeling uh-huh. of that song, right. but I, I made it. So uh, it's still a really good song. It's kind of dark, but it was kind of dark a little bit. Yeah. I just submitted it for uh, the Bill and Ted movie that's coming out. Huh. So hopefully it gets in the soundtrack. So I, so then he said, what else you got? <laughs> Well, the thing is, I had written like I had written like twelve songs. Uh huh. You only had twelve so, at this point, okay? I think, and I played him "Looking for Love, Ready for War." I played him uh, a couple other songs, and he goes, "These are really great." He goes, "I really like the chords that you're using." And what were the chords? They were just open, open chords. No, they're just like stuff that you would like, write songs. It's like with. D, like, like an open D or an open G or. A, I think he meant. I think he meant the progressions. I think he oh, meant okay. that I wasn't really worried about. At the root of it, you could strip it back and just <laughs> were sit they at a all, campfire. Were they all like in the box, you know, progressions, like the pop, like the three chord progressions? Three and four, but like if you break down any of the great songs, they're all going to be. They're yeah, just at of the course. root. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that he liked is that I could sit down at a campfire or at a party and you could sing these songs. He and wanted get to hear them stripped down, which is very, which is pretty much genius of a producer. To, uh, well, think yes. You know, you know what it remind me of? is when Jimmy Iovine asked Tom Petty to play songs and he said he played him Refugee and Acoustic and then he played him uh, Here Comes My Girl and he goes, that's it, we got the record. That's uh-huh. it. Yeah. So, Which I'm not comparing myself to, to him. I'm just saying it was that situation where he wanted to hear it. So then he goes, you have your notebook? He goes, let's write. He, I said, well, I kind of wanted to make this feel like a Fleetwood Mac part. He goes, you like Fleetwood Mac? I said, I'm a really big fan of Lindsey Buckingham's uh, yeah. guitar playing. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, so, sorry. So, he goes, cool. I said, well, he goes, well, let's write a song using the same chords of Fleetwood Mac. And I think he played, um, huh. you can go your own way, like uh-huh. the chords. Mm-hmm. And he goes, can you come up with something over that? And I said, tell me a title. Also, he like. had a guitar in his hand, too. Yes, yes. And he could learn everything because he's and a what genius he have, level. Did he have acoustic or electric? or? What yeah, he had, had acoustic. He had acoustic, and he picked out the same chord progression. What kind of like guitar was it? Max <clears throat> what, what? I, don't fu- I don't fucking know. Probably okay. some fucking... <clears throat> Probably the same one that was used on Tommy. Uh, uh, of, of antique Martin, <laughs> the worth a hundred thousand yeah. dollars. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, but he doesn't act like that. He's he's seriously down to earth. Huh. So he started playing the chord progression to like this Fleetwood Mac song to go your own way. It up. I don't know some song like that. I can't remember. And um, he goes, "Let's write a song to it." Hum. So I just started humming. He goes, "That's good. Go to that chord." And I, wow. and he goes and he goes, "Where is your notebook?" And I I said, "Name." I said, "I always like this title." 
in the title was the whole world's going crazy, but at least I got you, baby. Uh -huh. And I said, I think that's like super long and cool. He goes, let's do it. So we sat there and over the chords, I wrote this really big fucking chorus over the chords on the spot to him. And it was really good. And he's like, holy shit, this fucking rock. <laughs> this is fucking, this is fucking awesome. So we hung out and he goes, well, this is great. Yeah, go ahead. Hold on one second. On one second. Yeah. Tuck put me on hold. Sorry. Okay. I got to text you. So, yeah, so the, the first time went really good. I just kind of played him songs, not in full voice, just kind of like showing him the things, and he really liked it. And then uh, I went home riding high, and uh, he talked to my manager, and he's like, I, you know, he texts us on thread. He goes, I really like Tuck a lot. He's got great songs. <laughs> let's, let, let's, I mean, let's, keep, you let's keep moving forward. You had to have, when he, when you heard that, you must have said, I'm a fucking bad motherfucker. <laughs> no, no, no. I just, it was validating to me because I worked yeah. so hard and to have hit somebody like him who's worked on big records say, your songs are great. It made me feel good because I worked so hard. Oh yeah, <laughs> trying to trying to keep them simple. And how long to were keep... you, how long were you at Rob Cavallo's house? A couple hours, <laughs> and so and so I went home and I kept writing, and I dim out the song we worked on, and I, I had a reason to be like it's deadlines, right? It's good to have deadlines and good to have so, a reason to be inspired. So you demoed the song that was over a Fleetwood Mac chords. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What song did that become? It didn't make the record because I wrote stronger ones in the end. So huh. I, I will say that it's still good. It might be on the next record. But so I came back to Rob's a couple months later and I played him my demos. And then he's like, oh, this is great. This is fucking great. <laughs> but he did say, he goes, you know, some of the stuff you play, he goes, play me your songs again. He goes, some of the stuff sounds like 80s rock and some of it sounds like oasis so i'm confused uh -huh. i said because you're hearing them on acoustic let me play you for the demos so when i played him the demos that he could kind of hear like on what kind of love the demo is really close uh structurally and everything of what's going on to the record right not much is different so it's the big hand claps the big drum beat <clears throat> and so uh he did that and then i went out to eat with him and his wife and their stylist friend at this diner and we just hung out. I told stories about living in the South and they just fucking loved it. And his wife said she, I reminded her of one of the tiger beat models from the seventies. Oh, she boy. had those. <laughs> walls. So I don't think that hurt my call. <laughs> wow. What diner? I mean, they took you to a, they took you out to eat to a diner, a nice one. It's the nice one down there. And like, it's a famous one. Okay. The deli or something. Okay. Like something. All right. <laughs> I can't remember. So his wife really... loved you too. She thought you were cute. She, you I don't know. Cool, she you had was... a cool haircut. Yeah, she just said I looked like the classic like seventies teen beat kind of thing. Oh, which well, is thank funny. God you got a haircut before you headed out to L.A. Yeah, I know. So <laughs> it was it was really good, and I was I was super stoked. And he was so kind and professional, uh, and just cool. I don't know. So what ended up? So then, so how did he ended up say, coming to do the record when you had no budget? So then I went home and wrote some more. And then he goes, I think we have a record, Tuck. I want to make a record with you. Uh huh. Well, that's great. Great compliment. Yeah. But it took, it took, I mean, this was like six months uh -huh. going back and forth. Mm -hmm. He's a big deal. The, he yeah, hasn't he, made a rock and roll record in a while. So for him, it's a big thing. What was the last rock record he did? I had a big Shine Down record. Oh, not a, I don't know that band. So. So I went out there. I finally got out of the earache deal. It took me so fucking long. And so when I finally got out of that, I said, I'm out. He goes, well, let's make a record. Uh, he was waiting for you to be contract. He was waiting for you to be legally out of, out of jail. I was. I couldn't really do anything. He knew oh. I was going to get out of it. Oh, okay. But um, so his label doesn't sign rock stuff. They're not interested in taking a risk. Uh -huh. So my manager's like, I, let's do this. So I went and met Doug McKean, the guy who did the engineer. We went to a little listening room and we played all of my demos and he made notes on all the songs. 
this one's great. This one's good. We're going to cut this. We're going to cut this. Uh, and then the next day we went back through them again and listened to them. And at this point I had probably like 25 songs. I hadn't did any co-writes really. Right. I'm trying to make this. Uh-huh, I'm short. listening. Yeah. I'm, I'm into it. I don't know. If, I don't know if this interview is dragging on. Too no, much. this I is, know. I, this is, uh, I'm captivated. Keep going. Okay. So I went back out there a couple times and it was all on my credit card. I was just taking a risk. You got to take chances on yourself. You know what I mean? If you, <laughs> if you believe in it, you just got to fucking, so, he, so he's not on board yet though. Cause you don't, didn't, I mean, did, when he said, I want to make a record with you, did he say, how are you going to pay for this record? Tom? No, no. Cause we, we, we're about to get there. So he says, I got songs. He goes, I want to make a record. Cause this is going to be a lot of fun and you got great songs. And I don't like how labels treat artists. Huh, and I weird. feel like he says, I feel like there's an audience for what you're doing. That's asleep. And we really need authentic artists. Because if you don't know me and you just look at a picture or something, you might think I'm just a fucking fake. But when he hung out with me, he was like, fuck, you You really are, are kind of knowledgeable about this rock and roll, about rock and roll, and you really believe it. Um, so he was like, I'm all in. So then the next thing was go get a record deal. That's what he said. Go get a record deal, but I'm all in once you get a budget. Yes. Huh. Well. Then you want to talk about a whole other mountain. Yeah, how does a because how does a guy in a that? failed uh, pop punk band or whatever a failed um, <clears throat> underground rock band get a record deal? Sorry, my manager's calling. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, everybody's calling right now. Uh, so we won't go too much longer. About twenty. No, minutes no, it's fine. I, I I like telling the story. It's fucking crazy. <laughs> All right, so. So how do you get a record deal? Because that's not that's easier Dude, was, said than done. I thought I thought, being a little bit naive, that just because Cavallo had signed on, I was uh, going to be able to get the cream of the crop. Right? Yeah, it's like I got Jim Carrey to do my to sign on to do my movie. You want to pay? Boy, for was I wrong. Boy, was I wrong. So what do you do? Call up every record label and say, I got Rob Cavallo on board. You want to? So do my manager knows a lot of people from being in the industry. Okay, and he did the work. So we put together about five or six songs right mm -hmm. with a couple of live pictures and photos from biters right and he sent out dude it was probably 40 to 50 labels from major labels to indie labels that might be able to cough up enough to do the record hold on one second all right, all right. who's texting you uh couple different people okay Tell my manager me. just texted it's fine I could, I, I could. so uh, so i had like a dropbox link with all my home demos and i was going back and forth to writing trips and then during this time i wrote with a bunch of great writers uh i wrote with butch walker uh -huh. which is my buddy i wrote with from my Atlanta, buddy so. yeah well, he lives in la but uh, chris seafried which works for a lot of stuff. I was writing with Keith and a couple other people just to try to see if I could get any tracks. Well, every single label was turning me down. This is cool. I just don't think there's a market for yeah, it. Rock's not this, selling right now. This, rock's not selling at all. This is cool. So I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but we went to Interscope, mm -hmm. which Rob has a great relationship with. And my manager and Rob Cavallo went to have a meeting at Interscope together brought the demos oh i also went to sony red uh -huh. and they were super hot about it my buddy don robertson and he went flew to new york and made a presentation about it and they said uh we don't want bands like this we want bands like lovely the band we want pop stuff we're not going to do rock uh -huh. like this so i had people rooting for me that i couldn't get to catch a break and this is a small story you might like they went into interscope and they played him some of the demos and Rob goes, I can blow this up. And the guy goes, this is super cool. This has kind of got an American rock vibe. I really <laughs> like this. And uh, they said, yeah, you know, we have the struts on here uh -huh. and they're doing really good. And we just did their record. We've made it three different tries to get it right and blah, blah, blah. And the a &R guy said to Cavallo uh, right there, he said, so Rob, 
when you do this record, are you going to add any elements of trap or hip hop drums to oh, it? Brother. Because <laughs> listen, because you know why? Because trap and hip hop uh, do really good on quarterly revenue and they uh -huh. stream the best. So we've been making our rock bands put elements of trap in. Oh, them. is that what the and struts do? I don't know. So, so I don't even know what trap Cavallo, is. Cavallo <laughs> looks. Cavallo looks at my manager and goes. Uh, have you just heard what we played you? Like, how could you even fathom to think to put trap or hip hop beats into this? And they said, well, no, thanks. Got up and walked out. Let me ask you this. If I can interrupt, if okay, they, good. if, uh, if they would have said, we'll sign you, if you'll put some trap and hip hop beats into this, would you have done it? Fuck no. And neither okay, would Cavallo. Good. Okay, good. Neither Cavallo likes rock and roll, dude. He's, he's honestly, not he doesn't his brain doesn't think like that he doesn't cater to radio he doesn't cater to labels he doesn't cater to trends i can attest to it you know don't give i don't want to be negative but uh that guy who at interscope that you got that they met with he's a douchebag i don't know dude i'm not trying to throw them under the bus but anyways i don't know it was really weird and then i realized that i'd gotten in way over my head and I, was like, <laughs> I was like fuck so we had a couple of mid-level offers, but, you know, Cavallo is not – I don't want to talk about money. I mean, but records don't cost – you can't charge the same as you used to. Yeah. The budget's just not there. So he, we were going to do the most streamlined budget as possible, and we, I probably got turned down by 40 labels. So what were the – you said some mid-level labels wanted to sign you. What? Which Can you name some of those? You were talking to, like, Sumerian and stuff like that. Okay, I don't really know those labels. So. Yeah, well, there, there's no like, there's no rock and roll labels, honestly. Mm, right. There's. So we were just talking. You know, we were like, we were talking to labels like Epitaph and things like that. They didn't uh, want it. Um, they wouldn't like, have a big budget anyway, probably. I mean, I think they would. They have those emo bands that are pretty big. So. Okay. So. And then we sent the demos to Alan Kovac. My manager knew him. Because my manager used to manage John Karabi back in the 90s, uh -huh. and Alan Kovac manages Motley Crue, and they went through a lawsuit against each other. That's how they know each other. Uh -huh. But I guess he was friendly enough, and, and uh, Alan Kovac called me and tried to put me on retainer right then and said, we've been looking for an artist like this. You got great songs. Huh. They, hit all the al they hit all the algorithms. Let's do a record. They hit all the algorithms. What does that mean? That means they everybody nowadays runs your songs through an AI algorithm program what to see fuck? it to see, I'm telling you <laughs> to see to see if it's going to react on digital streaming platforms wow that is insane man yeah they run like <laughs> any any new band any new band you can think of that are kind of above the underground and big stuff like that that are getting pushes they're byproducts of algorithms. So your music passed the algorithms. And the reason why I think they passed is because I write in single form. So wait a minute. They did, you, the music did well with their algorithms or did not it, do it well? It hit, dude. It killed with the algorithms. Okay. And they type, you do tempo, chord change, melodic structure, um, all this stuff, and that's what they determined. Now, I, I heard stories from people who, older than me that they said, like in the 90s and 80s and things, they would call radio, like people, would, radio stations would call people and they would listen to them, to the songs, and tell me if they liked them or not. Yeah. Focus so they've always, been doing, they've always been doing testing, but now they have to hit algorithms. It's like how fast you get to the chorus. Is there a melody here? Well, apparently a lot of the songs I were writing, that I did on this record, just smashed the fuck out of the algorithm. Uh -huh. Okay. So that worked in my favor. Wow. So, but I didn't know anything about it. I was just writing tunes. So know. did Alan Kovac, did he end up signing you? Yeah. You know, you well, could, I, it seemed like you could game the system if you could figure out how to do the algorithms. I did. I cracked it. Huh. Did, so you knew the algorithms already before you brought them to the guy? No, I didn't know they existed. <laughs> it was an accident. You accidentally beat all the algorithms. I, I guess, like, naturally, I, I hit them. All right, so friends, who anybody I who's listening... Out, I found out about ahead. the algorithms afterwards. I found out about it afterwards. 
So anybody who's listening to the show right now and trying to get a record deal, listen to Tuck Smith and the Reckless Hearts new album. And uh... <laughs> I didn't know what the algorithms were till afterwards. It that was intuitive. Crazy man. It was intuitive. <laughs> oh, so he signed you. Yeah, but I didn't. I still tried to shop for a while uh-huh. because you know, Better Noise wasn't. It didn't have. It has Motley Crue. But it has a lot of active rock bands that I'm nothing like yeah, at yeah, all. Yeah, and so I, I was I was very, very, very weary about signing. So I had made sure they were gonna let me have creative control. Uh-huh. Okay. So you artwork. You, need artwork. To, you needed to make sure you had con- creative control. Yeah, that was my stipulation. <laughs> right. Uh before we signed and made the record. I would and, imagine and they wouldn't care as long as you hit the algorithms. Well, dude, I was just worried about, you know, like promotional materials. Yeah. I need to make sure it looks like how I want it to look. Uh, very... You wanted to have the, the album and the videos and stuff look the way you wanted them I, to look. I, yeah, I, I, I produce my videos and do all the yeah. artwork. I'm yeah. like very, I like attention to detail. And I was worried they were going to come in and try to, uh, I had all these inhibitions I didn't know. I mean, I thought, Rob, we we're going to make the record and it might turn into something I didn't want it to either. I was really worried and I was wrong. But... Yeah, so, you know, after a lot of negotiation, we came to an agreement, and then really quickly I went to the studio with Kavala into one of the biggest, best studios in the fucking world that most people don't get to go into. Truly blessed. In L.A. or New York or where? L- L.A., L. Oh. yeah. Sphere Studios. Linda Perry used to own it. Okay. Huh. And so I had some of the best session players. Me and Rob handpicked all the people oh, to play on. Oh, so, so the record has session guys on it. Yep, me and Rob handpicked it. Has Vinny Cayuta on drums? Oh wow! From uh, the, be- from the best drummer person. in the world. What Vinny, Vinny Cayuta? Uh, who, who who is he? Dude, with? Hey, dude, he's worked with. He well, wasn't he with Frank Zappa? Yes, he was on Joe's seen. Garage, right? Yeah, dude, he's he's won Modern Drummer eighteen times. Yeah, he's like I remember Harold. the song with Dale Bosio, Vinny Cayuta on the uh, yep. Joe's Garage song, Catholic so, Girls. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Huh. So Vinny, wow. played, Vinny played drums. Wow. Yep. <laughs> And my buddy, Tim Pierce, who's played with everybody and played for Rick Springfield. I made him sign my Rick Springfield 7 And what's he, what's he played? He played guitar with okay. Ricky and mm-hmm. me. Um, and Chris Chaney on bass, which plays with fucking James Addiction <coughs> right, and yeah, yeah. everybody. And then uh, Jamie Marabak on keys, because I wanted a lot of keys and stuff. And uh, it, Ricky, I didn't have a band, but I knew that I wanted Ricky to play with me, a guitar oh, so player. So he did play guitar parts on the, on the record. Yeah, so I flew Ricky out. I said, Ricky, I don't think he knew what was going on. I said, hey, man, I'm doing a record with Rob Cavallo. Are you going to play guitar? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm in. But I don't think he really knew how serious I was. He just said, yeah, I'm in. He didn't know, realize the power of, of the, the, the uh, cred of Rob Cavallo. I don't know. I don't think so. And I think he thought I was kind of bullshit. <laughs> like, talks okay. over here saying he's going to do this. Right, yeah. Because I don't really talk about, you know, I don't really talk about stuff like that. I just yeah. kind of do it. Yeah. And the next thing you know, I said, here's your itinerary. <laughs> And he said the first day he showed up, he goes, this is real. And the first day of recording, they pitted Ricky and Tim Pierce together in the studio. And Ricky got his ass handed to him. Huh. So he, and he was super upset. And we had a talk that night. And he came back the next day of the studio. And he showed his ass and fucking ruled. Huh. <laughs> and just, wow. it was so awesome to see it. And him and Tim Pierce. Now, I can play guitar, and I've been playing for a while, but watching Ricky and this other guy play. Yeah, Ricky's dueling, a solo, plays solos, and the other guy, Tim Smith. I don't know him, but he's, I would imagine. Tim Pierce. They play dueling harmony solos uh, live. A la Thin Lizzy. With a track, dude, Boston, Thin Lizzy, anybody. Dude, it was fucking amazing. Wow. <laughs> Man, that's a fucking great story. Have you told anybody that story before? Nobody's heard it any of this. Wow. Time. That's a great story, really. So you got signed. I mean, we can do we can do part two next time if you want to. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> well, we'll go, let's go a couple more minutes if you don't mind. Yeah, so you good. got so you got signed to um Motley Cruz label or Alan yeah. Motley Cruz manager's label. Is that how you got on the uh stadium tour? Well, all they can do is recommend me. So I'm on the stadium tour because Def Leppard and Motley Crue like my record and signed off on it. Okay, so you didn't have to do a buy-in because there's something called a buy-in. You know, all I've that. never bought onto a tour in my life. I would never do that. <laughs> okay, that's good. I would never do that. And hope. So is that tour still on? 
it's not canceled. It hasn't even been postponed officially. I'm assuming it's going to get pushed back a little bit, but it's one of the biggest tours of the last decade. And there's hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. all in. So it's going to be the last thing they probably cancel. I'm thinking in <clears throat> July, it's going to happen instead of uh, June. Well, let's, let's hope that uh, we were allowed to go to concerts after July and July. Yeah. Well, I mean, Georgia's reopening Friday. So, not full on con- full on concerts, being able to play gigs and stuff. No, 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 but like all these places are opening. They're opening the economy back up in three tiers. So like, I, it's crazy. Tattoo shops are opened and hair salons and bowling alleys. It's uh-huh. really weird, man. Well, hopefully it gets back together. So, are you a Molly Crew fan? Did you? When I was in the heart attacks and I was really hitting it hard on the partying, yes, huge. Because you know Motley, well, if you do that tour, uh, you'll be able to see firsthand uh, how they do their backing tracks, probably. Yep, something <laughs> I'm never, something I've never done. You're not going to do backing tracks, right? I don't even know how to do that. Good, good. Don't please don't, because Motley Crue uses a lot of backing tracks. I, you know what? If I didn't get what I, what I was needing from my band, I needed auxiliary, and I was at that level, I would just hire. Like, I saw Aerosmith really close one time with Cheap Trick, and I could see behind the stage, and they had a bunch of auxiliary players back there. Well, I know that. Well, Aerosmith has that, Aerosmith has that one guy on keyboards. Do they have some other people behind the stage too? Yeah, they had guys playing acoustic and singing. Huh, but I that's not normal. Know that. Because if you do a record that has a lot of layers and you want to compete, you're going to need. Yeah. Well, I, that, I know that Fleetwood Mac does that. I, that's better than backing tracks, at least. Yeah. So I've never had backing tracks. But like, what if you use, I'm deliberating. I haven't done this. But like, what if you had like a, a keyboard backing track or a hand clap backing track? Like something that wasn't even on stage. I mean, it feels weird. But like, I, I feel like if that was around in the 60s and 70s, they would have done that. Well, I hope you don't do it. I mean, you do what you want. I've never done it. I've never done it. All right. One last, I want to talk about Cheap Trick. You you played, you got on, (laughs) so how did, so I remember seeing on your Instagram or Facebook or something, you got on stage and played Surrender. They will, a lot of times they'll have guys, you know, come on stage and play Surrender. That's the go-to song that they bring people up. Where, uh, how did you? I asked to play that one, by the way. It's my favorite song. So you did, how'd you get backstage? Was that on, were they on uh, the same, because they were on, uh, Big, what was the label they were on? Big, uh, big, big machine, big machine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, my wife is from Rockford. Oh, okay. All right. And she knows Dax and my mother-in-law ah, knows those people. So, so you got to go backstage so I, and meet them. And then... No, no, no. They, I, they just grew up kind of knowing them. Right. Uh-huh. So I know that Dax, a biters had opened for cheap trick. Mm, I didn't know at that. At the Buckhead Theater in Atlanta. Yeah, oh, wow. like 2013 and 14. So that's where I met them. And my aunt blew up at Soundcheck, and Rick let me plug into his whole wall of, oh, of Marshalls. Awesome. <laughs> so that's how he knew me. And then uh, I think he knew that uh, my wife was from Rockford and kind of knew that. But that day particularly, I was hired by Orange Amps to interview him and do a rig rundown. Oh, so Did I that ever come Rick out? Did that ever come out? Yeah, yeah, it's online. Oh, I got to look for that. So we're talking about his orange amps and, I, and he goes, what are you doing here? And I'm like, dude, what's up? I'm here to interview. And he's like, cool. <laughs> so we're interviewing and uh, there was a cheap trick cover band that followed cheap trick around. And it was before doors and Rick's out on the stage of the amphitheater with me interviewing him. And these fans come up. They're like, Hey Rick. He's like, how you guys doing? And he goes, uh, after they leave, he goes, they're in a cheap trick cover band. They're actually better than us. That probably needs him on stage. And I said, Rick, if you ever need somebody that's cute to come on stage and uh, help you fill out some of those guitar parts, I'm your man. He goes, okay, cool. You're coming up tonight. And he hollers back to his guitar truck and goes, I want to, Joe, after we do this, fit him for a guitar. He's going to come up with us tonight. Oh, that's great. I bet you were shitting your pants. I was more nervous. You talk about there's nothing. Oh, that's one of a dream to get on stage with. Cheap that's trick. my dream. Does he play? That's my dream. Does he play orange amps? Yeah, combo of orange and Marshall combos. I got uh, I got media access to a rock and roll fantasy camp uh, a long time ago, and Cheap Trick was one of the um, the, the people. Cheap Trick was at the fantasy camp doing their thing, and uh, I remember I went to hit to I each guy in the band did a. Um, did like a uh, 
what do you call it, a session. You know, they did a clinic, and I went to yeah. the Rick Spring uh, to the uh, Rick Rick Nielsen clinic, and he talked about how is everything goes to this little box. Did he talk about that? What do you mean, like little box? Uh, there's a box behind. He had a, a wall of dummy amps. At least this was back when I did this about 15 years ago. There was a wall of oh, dummy. Oh, it's probably amps. different now. And there yeah. was a box that he that the, the microphone would get shoved in the box, and so uh, yeah, he had a, he had a rack of get to, of amps, and then the speaker was this little box, and so that microphone went in there, so it would be the same sound every venue that they played. Oh, for consistency. They probably do something like there's no telling like what they do behind the yeah. scenes on that. But I mean, he, he doesn't he doesn't really use the half stacks. It was a lot of uh, combos and yeah. a lot of vintage orange stuff. So you already knew Surrender, obviously. That's what, So you said, can I play Surrender? And they said, OK, you're it's gonna... my favorite song, like period of all time. Yeah. What's, so, your, what's your favorite Cheap Trick album? I don't have a see like. My, I think pound for pound, my favorite all as an album is Dream Police. But you can understand, I love all the first four or five albums. I saw them. They did. Uh, this was when they had the Red Ant album. You remember the Red Ant, the self-titled Red Ant album? When was that? What year was that? Uh, maybe 15, 20, 15 years ago. Something. I like can't that. remember. Anyway, they put out an album for Red Ant. It was it was self-titled. That one and special. Oh, one. that one was good. That was oh, good. That you go listen to that album again and yeah. special one. Those okay. are great. Anyway, I saw them. They did three nights in San Francisco, and they did the first album, the first night, second album, second night, third album, third wow. night. It was fantastic. Wow. I mean, you got it like Heaven Tonight, uh, in black and white. All that stuff is um, it's all my favorite. But if I think about like album wise, when you like. As a full record, I think Dream Police, but I don't know, man. Yeah, most the people think Dream. Five. Most people think Dream Police is their best. I saw them on. I saw them in '77 opening up for uh, Wow, for Heart. No, for Foreigner. Heart might have been on the bill too. And that was an In Color tour, so that's why it's my that's favorite because cool. that's when I grew up was watching. In that, color. I don't really. Yeah, I can't really have a favorite. When they say what's your favorite? I say first four or five albums. Yeah. Uh, so I just you know. Well, Tuck, this was quite a. A lot better of a conversation than I was expecting it to be. <laughs> really? Okay. I feel like I just blabbed for a fucking hour and thirty minutes. Well, I, I don't know if any, anybody. I don't know if anybody's interested, but I certainly was. So that's all that matters. Okay. Good. Okay. Well. All right. So all right. Uh, so the new album you you put out the EP or the, the three songs. Uh, when is the, the new album's completely done? I'm assuming, right? Yeah, it's been done for like a year. So. Uh, are you waiting for the stadium tour for that to come well, out? Was, yeah, it was going to be released like right at the beginning of the stadium tour, but now it's on. Everything is on hold. Everything. So I don't know when it's going to come out. It's got to come out. You know, the best place to, for it to come out is during a tour. So it's probably going to get pushed back, which sucks. But there's nothing I can really do. Have we heard the best songs on the album? No. All right. Which song? So, who? Any songs that you had co-writers on the new album on the full length? Yeah. yeah. Glitter and the Greed sounds like a Butch Walker tune. I don't have the credits. No, no, no. We didn't write that. No. Okay. He he wrote one on the album, or no? Well, we co-wrote. So. So he co-wrote one on the album with you, or how many on? So who yeah, who one. co-wrote one. the songs that made it to the record? How many? Which songs have co-writes? Like what kind of love is one hundred percent me? Looking for love, ready for war is one of the first songs I wrote. The glitter and the greed, me and Keith Nelson wrote. Okay. Uh, I think the next single, uh, same old you. That's what me and Butch wrote. And you know, I like the writers that I want to go to are like people that I like, uh -huh. and it's not just like random folks. Oh, see. You know what I mean? How many songs on the album? I, I recorded 13, and there's 11 on the record, and two will be like bonus. Can you name all the song titles that are on the album? Track? Uh, I don't quite remember. Hold on. Let me get my masters. And were any of these songs going to be on the on the next Byers record? No, I've written everything um, <clears throat> after. Uh, you don't have to say all the songs. I just thought it might be cool for the uh, Tuck fans to, to hear some of the titles. Um, yeah, I just I I probably got there's a, like there's glam, there's Americana, there's a country song, there's power pop, there's some soul stuff. There's like two soul ballads. Hmm. Um, there's a lot of different stuff on here. I was able to flex a little bit more on this because I 
didn't have that kind of niche audience that biters if i try to stray a little bit i'll just get fucking beat yeah. to death yeah i can imagine they might have even got beat you a little bit if you went too far in the pop direction the biters fans yeah but i'll always but like when biters were doing melody for lovers like give me yeah. a fucking break man no no that, that was, was everybody's like, favorite back then that was 2010 and yeah. it's like then we got cast into the hard rock thing. And when I was putting out like Stone Cold Love, people were like, what is this? I'm like, I've always done glammy power pop. So it's just really weird. Yeah. So how many uh, records are you signed to do? Or do they have, how many records does Motley Crue's label own? Two. Tuck Smith. So they own you for two records. Yeah. Which is, which is what you want. I got no, dude, they're great. <laughs> and they're, they're not going to, they're not going to, uh, I mean, you're not going to have to change your name to do a record if everything falls through with them, are you? Nothing's going to fall through with them because I made sure that when I worked with them, they had enough power to put me on the level that I wanted to be. I mean, I really want to I want to be playing stadiums and I want to have really, really big records and I want it on my own terms. Yeah. And I feel like they let me do a kind of record I want. They didn't come and tell me what songs they didn't come to the studio. They didn't A&R me. They didn't do any of that shit, man. And did Earache do all that? No, but they're a very small indie label. And they still, and they fucked, and they owned you <laughs> in Earache, owned you. I had to. It's the only way I could keep moving. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. Well, Tuck Smith, I wish you all the luck on the new record. I appreciate I, I wish you, you all for the having success. me, man. That was, it was a really fun interview. Now, I was going to play a song at the beginning and the song at the end. Uh, any, would that be, po first of all, would that be okay? I don't care. Yeah, do what you and want. And second of all, which songs would you like me to play at the beginning and the end? Well, I don't care. What are you, you going to play? All right, you don't care. So I'll play. How about if I play a uh, Tuck Smith song, uh, uh, some, one of the three songs from the solo record, and maybe an old Biders tune? Would that be That's okay? Cool. All right, yeah, so, man, so, whatever you want. All right, Tuck Smith, I really appreciate you doing this. It was a lot of fun. Hey, man, I appreciate you so much. Thank you. All right, I'll talk to you later. Thanks. All right, buddy. All right, all bye. Right. There you go. <laughs> Tuck Smith, Tuck Smith and the Restless Hearts. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy with that. I thought it was pretty good. I learned some, I had some good stories or I heard some good stories. Thank you, Tuck Smith, for doing this. Friends, if you like this interview, I hope you will uh, consider that it's a value for value. And uh, if you got any value out of this, um, please donate to the Rock and Roll Geek Show. And if you like the interview, go to Tuck Smith on his Instagram or Facebook. Let him know you heard him on the Rock and Roll Geek Show so he didn't think he wasted uh, one hour and 28 minutes talking to uh, an idiot up in the mountains. All right. Thank you for listening, friends. I'm going to close out with a song from uh, Tuck's new record, which is this song is called The Glitter and the Greed. Thanks for listening. I'll talk to you soon.
It's a rock and roll geek train wreck. <laughs> 